Hey everyone, Greg Meskel joining you here for more At Home with USA Water Polo. We have a great conversation on the way. Thanks everyone for tuning in and joining us. If you're here live on Facebook, feel free to add comments into the Facebook uh, section there and we'll pass them along. This conversation is all about the road uh, to making Team USA and joining us here, two members each of our men's and women's senior national teams. These are all uh, members of the national team, but also Olympic hopeful. So no one in this mix has made an Olympic roster yet, but that's what they're after, uh, in addition to all the other great things that they've accomplished in the world of water polo. Uh, the athletes joining us, Dylan Woodhead and Chancellor Ramirez from the men's national team, Amanda Longan and Jordan Rainey from the women's national team. We'll kind of kick things off here and just have each of these athletes give us a little bit of background on how they got into the sport and, and uh, their entry into this game of water polo and kind of how they got to where they're at right now. And um, I'll have Amanda just kind of jump in and lead us off here. And Amanda, thanks for uh, joining us and tell us a little bit of your story. Thanks for having us, Greg. Um, well, when I had just promoted from eighth grade, I was going into high school and I had a family friend who she could no longer do land sports. And so she was going to try out water sports. Her mom forced my mom to make me go with her. <laughs> and so they told me to go to practice and I went and I bought a one piece and everything and um, I jumped in the pool that summer right before high school and the first day they had me in the field wasn't so good the second day they were like oh you're super tall we're gonna put you in the cage and that was just that was my spot and so made it through high school I didn't start club or ODP until my sophomore year of high school my I'd watched the Olympics that summer after my freshman year and I was like that is exactly where I want to go and so I went and I back and I talked to my coach, Larry Felix, and I said, all right, this is what I'm doing. You have to help me get here. What do I do next? And he said, ODP for exposure, experience, different coaches, different athletes, same thing with club, just to see other people, other faces and learn other skills. And so that's how I made my way to then um, getting recruited to go to USC and so on and so forth. Excellent. Uh, Dylan, tell us about your uh, entry here in the water polo. Yeah. Um, thanks, Greg. I, I think my entry stems from kind of the community that surrounded uh, my area where we played water polo. I just had a great group of guys that, that started playing and combined swimming, which I had done and my mom had done in college and baseball, which I'd love to. Um, and I think I just wanted to join a community that was as, as supportive as the one I had. And um, I kind of worked through the stages. I started in sixth grade and didn't really have a long-term vision, I'd say, until probably about my junior year of high school when I, I kind of committed to water polo and quit the other sports I was playing. But um, yeah, I've just, I've just kind of slowly worked through the ranks. I started ODP, I think, in late eighth grade. Um, and yeah, I started not making uh, the, or I didn't make the camp the first year and the next year I made the camp and the year after I made the youth team. Um, so very much kind of like a one step at a time for me. And um, I really just enjoy the process. But what's brought me most is kind of the community around me. And that's what really started my love and support for water polo. Jordan, I know you have a family history in the sport here, but tell us a little bit more about getting involved in water polo. No, I don't know. Uh, yeah, my mom and my uncle actually swam at UCLA way back in the day. My dad went to Pomona, D3, water polo, go hens. Um, but I actually did not like water polo when I started. Um, I really liked karate um, and I liked soccer, but I actually got injured. So I couldn't do any real land sports anymore. So my dad was like, you should try water polo, do it. And I was like, okay, fine. Um, and I ended up really enjoying it. I had really great coaches at Trojan Water Polo and Huntington Beach Water Polo. Mariah Van Norman was my coach at Trojan. Natalie Golda Benson was my coach at uh, Huntington Beach. So I was hooked and wanted to represent my country um, on the world stage. So I first tried out in 09 on my first ODP camp, got cut, first cut. Tried back in 2011, made Puerto Rico and went through the pipeline. I'm your typical pipeline um, candidate. So I ended up making it in 2017 for the senior team. Excellent stuff. And Chancellor, tell, tell us uh, to round things out. Last but not least, your uh, water polo adventure so far. 
Thanks, Greg. Well, much like Jordan, when I first started the sport, I didn't like it. I started out swimming at age four. At age nine, I transferred over to water polo because a close swim friend of mine recommended that I came and I tried water polo over at the Rose Bowl Aquatic Center with him. After my first night, I, I did not want to go back. I talked to my dad, talked to the coach who was Jimmy Campillo at the time. And he said, okay, I understand you were uncomfortable tonight. It was a new thing. Why don't you stay for the whole week? And after one week, then you can really make the final decision if you're going to stick with the sport or not. So after one week, stuck with the sport, loved it. Two years later, I tried out for my first Coastal California zone team. Uh, much like Jordan, again, I was cut the first year. I stuck with it one year. Next, I made the team to uh, go to the regional tournament. And this was, I think, before it was actually ODP. And I don't really remember the name we used for it then, but I've been playing the sport for 15, 16 years now. So that, that, that's a cool little fact. But um, so I made my first regional team, went on to make the national team selection camp, and then went on to make my first national team and I think we had Canada or Australia come visit us at Newport Harbor that upcoming summer. So we actually didn't go to Europe. But I think that was my first time when really I understood that I could play the sport and travel the world and represent my country and represent my family in maybe one of the, the biggest stage of our sport, which is my ultimate the uh, Olympian. So I kind of climbed through the pipeline throughout there. And I made my first senior national team in 2013, actually when Coach Udovicic had his first summer tournament. I think it was me, Alex Obert, and Alex Bowen. And we were the three youngest on that world championships team. Um, and actually, Greg, you told me, I think I probably set a record that summer when I went to World University Games, World Championships with the senior team, and then also Junior Worlds. And after that summer, I think it was 50, 53 days over in Europe without touching back home. Um, and so really that was a second uh, time in the sport where I, I saw that I was progressing well and I, I thought I could really become an Olympian. Uh, fast forward two years from there, I dealt with a small injury, which had consequences of me not being able to go to and continue to train to try out for the 2016 Olympic team. But I was lucky in 2017, I stuck with the sport, I recovered. And now since 2017 until present, I was able to be on the first 11 man roster of the US team to go to Pan American Games, help us win a gold medal and qualify the 2020 Olympic Games which we all know now is the 2021 Olympic Games. Um, so that's just a, a brief summary on how I started with the sport and where we are today. Yeah, uh, I was, I was gonna dive into that. We'll talk about that later on, but Chancellor's 2013 summer is one for the record books. Just kept playing and playing for Team USA on another roster, on another roster. I think you'll see a, a couple of themes with the group we have here today. Uh, everyone won an NCAA title. I'm pretty certain on that uh, at their various schools. Dylan and Jordan with Stanford. Dylan, the, the most recent champion here in 2019. Uh, Chancellor with UCLA, Amanda with USC. So uh, they've all been a part of really, really good college teams and now part of a really good national team. And another theme is all of them have worked extremely hard. Not that you don't have to work hard to be at this level of water polo, um, but all of them... I, at least I've, I've heard from other talking to coaches that coach them or people that play with them, exceptionally hard workers, right? Really, really trying to, uh, to kind of push, push forward and reach that next level. And that's a bit what we're talking about today, kind of making that next level. And so this is a question I'll kind of open up to the group again. Um, and Amanda, I'll start back with you. But let's, let's look back at your time at USC, national championship, one of the best players in the college game, right? You, you win all the awards that you'd want to win at that level. And then you're trying to make another team in the national team that's, that's so strong. How do you kind of reconcile that challenge, right? Because for the level you're at, you've done all the things you're supposed to do. You're, you're, you're as good on paper as you need to be. 
what's it like to, to try and figure out, well, now there's like a new mountain to climb? Well, anytime you join a new team and you're the newbie, you always have to work your way up, regardless as to whether you're the newbie or if you're somebody that's been there, you have a certain standard to maintain and even increase. And so for me, jumping onto this new team, I have to look at it as like all of these girls, the majority of these girls have accomplished the one thing that I've really set out for since I started playing this sport. They all have the one thing that, that I don't have yet. And I think having a mentality that you can have all these awards and records behind you, but think about um, you know, how much you put into all of those things. Could you have done more even then when you did all of those things? And can you change that and do that now? And I think to keep yourself from being complacent is to always be willing to not be super hard on yourself where it becomes a detriment to your playing, but to always be willing to critique. And you'll hear it all the time. It's, you know, it's kind of a total cliche in sports, but there's always progress to be made, but it's just so true. So. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point. And you're exactly right. I think even uh, we did a talk with Maggie Steffens a few months ago, or maybe it was yesterday. I can't tell anymore during this <laughs> pandemic, but uh, she's, she's one of these accolades, right? And she had, a, she, had a, she had a laundry list of things she wants to get better at, right? So regardless of if you're considered the best or you're working your way up, everyone's working on something. Dylan, I wanted to ask you, coming off of a Stanford team, you look at the Stanford team you're on, very, very good team, right? But just inherently at Stanford, the team does not play typically a ton of games. There, you know, there's not, it's, it's, it's not always a schedule where you play 35, 40 games. There's not always a person on that team that scores 80, 90 goals, right? So you're already in a system where, outside of Ben Halleck, right, there, there's typically not a person that's going to score a crazy amount of goals, right? So statistically, you're maybe not amongst the conversation of look at look at all the stats this guy piles up, right? So what's the what's the challenge for you to find a role on that team and be very effective, and then to go to the next level and say I can also be very effective at this national team level and be a really important addition? Yeah, um, I, I think the biggest thing is as many of our teammates would come down to is it basically comes down to the team, and I think the team success comes more importantly than any individual success. Like you remember national champions more so than you remember who is all Americans or stuff. Um, so I, I think as teams develop and this national team develop, it really is tailoring um, each of our individual skills to how we can help the team the most. Um, and I think with Stanford, like we have a very variety, a very diverse set of skill sets. Uh oh, that cut out there for a little bit. I know, yeah, just a touch, but you're okay. Yeah, but. Like, I think um, the strength of the team is individual, but the strength of individual is the players you have around you. And that's very cliche, but um, you kind of tailor your abilities to what your team needs. So I think as I, as I learn and grow with this national team, it's really just adjusting and getting better and improving at the things that um, I can help the team most at. Um, and like Amanda said, I think the biggest thing that we can focus on as Olympic hopefuls and as athletes, is just um, taking kind of the big goals and problems that we have um, and just taking it in small pieces and one at a time. And I think um, something that I've had a little mantra with um, one of my pool guys at Avery Flower Center, Tim Edmonds, is just getting better every day. And um, I think that's something that's been harder to do over um, this COVID pandemic, but it's something that applies to every day of being an athlete. And if you can keep getting better, um, at the things you want to get better at every day, eventually you will reach that level. And eventually your team um, will reach kind of the goals they want to set or the goals they set for themselves. Jordan, also a Stanford Cardinal, you're in a similar situation where you're on this stack team, right? A very, very good team. I mean, everyone in this conversation, you look, you look at the rosters you were on in college, the teams are loaded, right? They're very, very good teams. Jordan, you're on a really good team. How do you balance there and then also with Team USA you want to be, be part of the team and do whatever the team needs, but you're also trying to assert yourself and show your value. Was that a statement or was that a question? Yeah, it was a little bit of both. It was kind of like, <laughs> these are things that you could think about and what do you think about them? Ah, okay. Um, yeah, I think my teams at Stanford were super stacked. Um, I won two NC2A titles. 
Amanda actually beat me in the other two one goal games. Still love her though. Um, but just the transition of going from college to national team, it was really nerve wracking, super scary. The team is even more incredible than your college team. It's a completely different ball game. It's way more competitive, but just continuously inserting yourself um, and trying to show your authentic self whenever you can and giving your best effort each and every day. Um, I have a bunch of post-its on my wall and I was thinking about this when Dylan was talking. Um, it says, I'm trying to be 1% better each day and by the time we get to the end of the year, that's a lot of percentage points and that's kind of what I tried to emulate in the water. I mean, at this level, all of us, we're not gonna make huge jumps in our skill level but if we put in 100 percent, we're gonna get a little bit better each day on the things we want to work on so by the time we get to the end of the year all of those things are gonna the details add up that's uh, that's a very good point and i think anyone at at the level of the four athletes here you have to have that long-term view right of like i'm trying to do this over time because you, you probably i'll talk about this a little bit later on but you might, you might make yourself crazy, right? If you were thinking about it, like every single day is the day that decides what happens, yeah, yeah. right? When there, it's a long trip. Chancellor, you described this epic 2013. You're one of the youngest guys in the team. I have to imagine after that summer, you're like, okay, like, here we go. Like I'm on all these teams. I'm rolling right now. But then you mentioned the injuries. You end up having to take a bit of a step back from this dream. How did you handle that? That had to be a disappointing moment when you were pushing forward in 2013 now it's back but now you're back on that climb again how'd you handle that it was definitely a slow recovery and i would say my body recovered faster than my mind after two weeks i was back in the water but it we all know it, it's hard to come back in the water after two weeks and now we've been out for three months and it's hard to get back into that shape you were in originally um, but I was extremely lucky that during this time I was at UCLA, we just brought on one of the, the top sports psychologists in sports and this coach's name is Lenny Wersma. He's still working with the UCLA men's water polo team and he's a professor at Fullerton also. And he helped me do these small exercises of, of breathing, but also just trying to not dwell on the past and just focus on the, the present and then preparing for the future, but not thinking about the future too much. It's kind of focus on the present moment right now. And then once when the future comes, we'll deal with the future once when it's the task at hand. And, and then to end that, so so that kind of helped me stay in, in the present moment because I would hop in the game or I'd hop in training and I was frustrated with myself that I wasn't at the point where I was before injury. And so I started to overthink, maybe I would take one shot in training and we get counterattack and they'd score on us. And then I would think about the negative action. Well, he helped me understand that I could witness and acknowledge that negative action you could write it down on a piece of paper or mentally you put a period after it and now that action is finished and so now it's time to refocus and focus on the next offensive possession and so he and i would just come up with you see like a lot of these nba basketball players and they write a couple notes to themselves on their shoes maybe lebron has something and all the top athletes so for me after a while i started writing on my left hand inside of my palm, just play. Because that was kind of a mental trigger to me, just to continue to stay in the present moment, don't think too much, and just let the game flow. We all try to get in the zone, but that's very hard to get to every game. You know, we all have, can draw on past experiences where we said, well, wow, that game, I just felt like out of body experience. I don't even know how I, made all these blocks or scored all these goals or stopped the top defender this this past game and so coming up with just play was what really helped bring me back together refocus and then prepare for the future 
and helped me get to where I am today and having a second shot to make my first Olympic Games. I love that idea of giving yourself a very easy to remember kind of mantra. It was interesting and uh, the men's team didn't get a chance to do this yet. Hopefully they will, but Jordan and Amanda will remember we had this opportunity to do a lesson in improv comedy earlier this year. And one of the main mantras is don't think, right? The premise being in the moment, you know what to do, right? So do, the more you think about it, the more you'll get caught up in your head and the moment will pass you by to be able to execute the way that you'd like to, whether in that case it's making someone laugh or in this case it's making a save or scoring a goal. I also wanted to build off of what you were talking about um, as far as goal, goal setting. So everyone in this group is trying to make an Olympic team. They've all made the national team at different levels. That is a gigantic goal, right? It's a very, it's a very large uh, task at hand. And it requires a lot of not only physical work, but I think mental work to understand how am I going to go and chip away at this thing. Amanda, I was thinking back to, I think it was maybe the first NCAA title that USC won. That was, I think, 2016, maybe at UCLA. That was the one with Steph shot, right? No offense, Jordan. Sorry. But anyway, <laughs> it happened. I didn't, I didn't decide it. But uh, after that game, I remember talking to Amanda, and it was almost like uh, you were so, like, um, clear on what you thought was going to happen like you had you had you'd had this vision of how you thought things were going to go and the fact that you won even in this crazy dramatic fashion it it wasn't really all that surprising to you because you had felt like this was like a bit preordained like we had put the work and this was going to happen i'm curious as you're a little bit older now and you kind of aim towards making an olympic team how do you mentally handle the challenge of trying to achieve something so big Well, I think for me, okay, so this past year was my first full year with the senior national team trying out for the Olympics. And while the physical training was way more and way harder than anything um, I've ever done, I still felt coming from college to this, I still felt like I had a really good foundation in terms of physical training and, and mental training coming from USC's program and Yovan and all the above. And I used to meet with a sports psychologist there as well. And I'm a strong advocate for meeting with sports psychologists. Just thought I had to throw that in there because for me this past year, I think it's been more of a mental struggle for me than it has been on the physical side. Um, if you, I mean, just in the grand scheme of things, when you refer to that 2016 period of time, and when I look at how I need to play now to make this team, how I felt then was consistent. How I need to feel now is consistent with my play. And I've always been told that the better prepared you are prior to a game happening, the less fearful you should be when you enter the game. And that way you can play loosely and freely like Chancellor was talking about. And I can tell you my junior year of college as well when we won, after coming off a loss to Jordan my sophomore year um, and Stanford, uh, I was so mentally just, dis I was just so disheartened that entire summer going into the next fall. And part of me, after playing in my first a senior world championships and everything. And that was an exciting big thing that I'm super grateful for that kind of pulled me out of that slump a little bit. But I had to tell myself, you need to, as much as I'm somebody that I started really late in water polo. And so I had to, you know, catch up, catch up, catch up. And I just wanted to hurry up the process, I guess. I had to be patient with myself. And it's really, it's a lot easier said than done. And I think every single one of us here has, um, learn that the hard way but I really had to tell myself if things don't pan out I will be okay I have time I will get another chance I had to tell myself that whether I would believe it some days or not just so that I could play loose and free because consistency is way better than someone that can play outstanding in one game but horrible on that, the next game and that's bound to happen here and there but the more consistent you could be. And that's how I'm looking at last year, trying to get there. And, and as far as this next year, I look at it as a great opportunity, even though it's been pushed back a whole year, it's a great opportunity for me to build on that, build my skill and become more consistent. And that was a very long answer to your question. No, that's, look, I mean, <laughs> to, to kind of dive into the mental side of it is typically not going to be just a two word response. So I appreciate <laughs> that. Dylan, similar to you, uh, how do you, in, in your mind, I guess, describe uh, how you approach this, this very large goal of trying to become an Olympian? Is there something you're telling yourself every day? Is there something that you 
refer back to? Tell us a bit of your process here as you try and work through this. Yeah, um, I, I just, I think for me, um, throughout my water pool career, um, most of my goals have been opportunities. And I, I see my goals as something that motivates me to get better every day, something that gets me out of bed and gets me to work hard with my teammates. Um, and I, th I think this opportunity is no different. I think like the, the weight it carries is something that is even more motivating um, and, and daunting at times, but um, kind of the support from your teammates and your coaches, it, it's achievable. And it's something that you think about your whole life. So it, I don't think for me, it's, it's hard to um, like think of the idea of, of being Olympian. It's, it's more of something that just like um, makes me, it drives me. So um, I would say that's it. <laughs> Jordan, to kind of just ask that same question, but modify it a bit. Um, in, in this national team situation, and fans might not realize this because maybe they just sometimes tune into the Olympic Games or World Championships, but you're trying to make a roster repeatedly over the course of a year. So you're trying to make the Intercontinental, then you're trying to make the Super Final, then the Worlds, then this thing, then that thing. You know, I, I sometimes think of it almost like the old Super Mario board, right? Where it's like you get to one level and then you can advance to the next and the next. How do you handle trying to make all those, and I won't call them little, but make those checkpoints in addition to having this longer term goal of the Olympics? The way you said it kind of overwhelmed me. Sorry. <laughs> all those things put together is extremely <laughs> overwhelming. But I mean, I just try to look at it in bite-sized pieces and stay as present as I can through the process because you're not going to be able to control what happens in the future. You're only able to control yourself in the moment. That's your work ethic, your attitude, body language with your teammates. So focusing more so on the present and exhausting every moment that you have during the process and seeing every moment as an opportunity instead of something that's scary, I think is super important. Um, but yeah, seeing it in bite-sized pieces, and even if you do fail, failure isn't a bad thing. Often failure teaches you more than when you're successful. So, and also leaning on your teammates for support because it is a very lofty goal, but we're not in an individual sport we're in a group of 16 girls fighting for the same spots, but we're still supporting each other. We still love each other. We still enjoy playing together. So there's a lot more that goes into it. Good stuff. We're talking with four members of the USA Water Polo senior national teams on kind of that road to making Team USA. They're all a part of the national team, but also looking ahead to Tokyo. Chancellor, similar to Jordan, you, you've had this experience of, of hitting these checkpoints and making rosters, and then you've been on the other side of it, as you described previously. As you look at the next year or whatever it might be to try and stay on course, how do you break, break down the big goal? You know, like Jordan said, it's kind of like a big meal, right? One bite at a time. Is that how you view it, or do you see the whole thing? Give us your thoughts. Uh, I, I do view it very similar to Jordan and I try to stay in the present moment, like she said, and definitely I know there's the, the end goal, but I need to focus on each step along the way and you can't go from zero to a hundred. And so I think just now focusing on each week, the men's team, we have our zoom meetings. How can I stay engaged with my teammates? continue to grow our relationships together? How can I work out with all 18 or 19 of us and work on my personal leadership skills is all some things that I'm trying to build now because then I think that will help us when we're all back in the pool. And then once we're back in the pool, it could be at the end of this summer, it could be next week, it could be in the fall, it could be early 2021. There's a lot of things up in the air. And I think just staying positive during this time is, is extremely important. So I'm doing all I can right now to prepare for that next time we're in the pool together as a team. And then we'll take the next step on from there. Uh, if you're watching live on Facebook, feel free to add a question or comment into the comments and we'll pass your question along. A heads up for you for uh, three-time Olympic goalie Craig Wilson is watching and gives a shout out and 
loves hearing about all of the new players. He says he's an old man from the 80s, and so he's excited to learn about uh, your, your adventures, of, including fellow goalie Amanda Longin. Um, just by a show of hands, who, who has seen the old movie with Chris Farley called Tommy Boy? Anyone? No? Wow, I'm, I'm really dating myself. Where I'm going with this is there is a scene in it, he's trying to be a salesman, and he talks about wanting the sale so badly that he sometimes freaks out and just doesn't know what to do. And I, and I was thinking as a very poor athlete who was cut from multiple teams, I can only imagine what it would be like to try and do what you all are doing. Amanda, I'll, I'll kind of come back to you and, and we'll try and break up the order here eventually so you don't feel like you're always the first one to, to dive on these questions. But I'll start with you and you've touched on this a bit, but how, you have this dream, you want it so bad. How, how do you not, um, I guess, focus on what you're after so much? You talked about trying to like play free and play loose and not think about it every day. I imagine it's part of that, but, and, and the rest of you can think about this too. How do you reconcile wanting this thing and wanting to do whatever it takes to get it, but also being able to play your game? Um, Chancellor said something a little while ago that was you can't go from zero to 100 overnight, but what we can all agree on is that you can always give 100%. Even when you're tired and your 100% won't look like it's 100% because it won't look pretty all the time, it will be your 100% and you can bank on that to know you're doing the right thing for you, but even more so for your team, which is a whole entire reflection of the country. And so to kind of answer your question previously, I think that for me, it's, it's really hard for me not to look at the end goal. Um, and I try my best to look at it small pieces at a time. And I think when I told you before, I kind of had to tell myself, I'll be okay, I'll be okay there has to be some sort of balance because you don't want to then super relax where then all of a sudden you're complacent and your hundred percent effort kind of diminishes because you're trying to not freak out. You're trying not to be nervous. There's a really fine line between how nervous you should and shouldn't be because I think nerves give you energy and I'm all about that energy and, and all, all of that during games and cheering on your teammates and really nice shot box. But, and that's great. But as far as I go and how energetic I want to be, that's great. But when it comes to nerves and that taking over, that's what shuts me down. So I, I really have to almost channel my energy into kind of other girls on the team and rooting for them, like for nice shot blocks or nice goals and invest in relationships there with people um, even more just to kind of sidetrack myself from thinking about just making the team because it's all about the journey. I want to engage in the process and I want to, at the end of it, regardless of what happens, look back and it have been a meaningful process. And that's truly where, I mean, as much as our main goal is that, that's truly what, if all else fails in the end, that I wanna look back on and enjoy and remember. So I think that's kind of, I'm trying to, day at a time, figure out how to make my journey pleasant. And, and for me so far it has been, and I'm just thinking about a whole nother year of um, seeing how I can increase that. And that keeps me from getting overwhelmed and thinking about the end. The journey is so, so important. Any, any Olympian I've ever talked to in any sport, if they were uh, fortunate enough to be successful, they of course remember those moments and they love a medal or the podium or whatever it might've been in their competition. But like right there, like 1A, right behind whatever the sport thing was, was something you wouldn't expect. It's a lunch somewhere at a hotel, and the stories they told, and it's just being part of that thing. You can't replicate it. You get a little bit of it probably in high school or college when you're just compressed uh, you know, on a team or in the same dorm, but a national team situation is a whole other uh, thing that, that you four know well. Dylan, sim similar to you uh, as what I asked Amanda, but reconciling this thing you want so bad and also being able to do the things you're supposed to do. Yeah, um, I, I think desire is a good thing, but I think as athletes, you need to know how to adjust and change yourself so that you play your best. Um, and I think something that our mental coach, Brian Alexander, has talked about, and I know Chancellor and maybe the girls team has talked about it, um, they call it your arousal level. And it's like a curve where if you're on one, two side, you're playing too frantically and your performance goes down. But if you're like not 
you don't come up enough for a game, you're too lazy or relaxed, you don't play as well. So it's kind of finding um, your flow state is what we call it. Um, and that's just something we have to, to learn how to get our bodies to as athletes and if we want to play our best. Um, so I think motivating and like wanting something really bad is a good thing, but you still have to be able to regulate that during a game, during a practice, so you can perform your best and you can uh, kind of give your best performance for your team. So that's how I've kind of um, adjusted to balance my, my performance. Jordan, how do you work through this same question, balancing the two? Yeah, I just try to think about the journey, like Amanda said, because at the end of the day, the gold medal is going to fade. The memories are what you're going to remember for the rest of your life, regardless of whether we make it or not. You're going to remember the times after we, you do a gnarly swim set, gnarly conditioning set, and you're just busting out laughing with your teammates over nothing. And those are the types of things that you remember versus, of course, you remember going up on the podium, but the medal will go into a safe and you'll take it out every couple of years, maybe. Um, but the way I see it, I try to look at it. Of course, I want to make the team. 100%. But at the end of the day, if I don't, I'll have another opportunity. And I try to see it as I have an anti fragile identity. I am not just an athlete. I am so much more than that. I am a daughter, a family member, a, a academic, a, a piano player, a, a friend, whatever it is. I'm so much more than an athlete and just seeing the whole picture of yourself and just being kind to yourself and seeing this as an opportunity to just be the best that you can be. Jordan, I think we're going to have to clip that out and probably reshare it multiple times because it was really well said and you hit on something that so many athletes during the pandemic are thinking about. People are so tied to the identity their sport provides that when they can't train and they can't compete and they can't do all these things, you have a lot of free time to start asking yourself, who am I and what am I doing and where's all this going? And so you hit on a lot of important stuff that people should, you know, I asked you guys a lot of these mental questions, not to pick away at, you know, something you're worried about, but because people that are coming up behind you have a lot of the same questions. And if they see that the people that are doing it at the very highest level have to answer these questions themselves, it'll bring them probably a little bit more comfort about making their high school team or trying to go from the B team to the A team in club, or whatever it might be. Chancellor, last but not least, how you're handling these, these two um, quandaries, if you will, right? It's like you want to be so good that you're an Olympian and that's what you're after, but you also want to be able to do the things you're supposed to do in the pool. Oh, you're muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> I think Dylan, Amanda, Jordan, Jordan, excuse me, they all had very good points. And it just comes down to not having regret at the end of the day. And I, I think it, it just, everything we've talked about previously at the start of this conversation, it, it plays into now and how Jordan made a great point that she's more than just a water polo player. And I know at the start of this, this stay at home with COVID, I, I had trouble thinking, okay, now what if the Olympics are actually canceled? Or what if um, there's not gonna be any more water polo anymore? And even people who are possibly in still college water polo, there was a period of time when they thought maybe their, their college team was gonna get cut. So they were also thinking, what if? maybe and they're having these identity issues as well but all we can really do is control the controllables and that that's very basic and that goes on to another sports psychology lesson that i think we've all gone through but but i think that's all we can do at this point how you approach each day you wake up motivated maybe you're a little less motivated than the day before but I know for sure once when I step in the gym or step onto the pool deck and I have all my closest friends next to me and we're all competing for sure, 
against each other. We all want the same spot. We all want to make it to the Olympics or the next trip. But in the end of the day, we have each other's back. We hold each other accountable. And we're there to pick up each other and motivate on each person's lowest day. So that's kind of how I've approached all of this. And, and if you're listening to all these athletes and you're hearing, um, and, and they've all said that they're cliche or phrases, uh, the reason why we're hearing them is because they're helpful and they work, right? So if you keep hearing these things over and over again, uh, controlling the controllables has been said a million times by a million different athletes, right? But it is very useful, uh, especially when you're, when you're in these high stakes, high pressure situations. We'll switch the order around here a bit. Dylan, I'll, I'll kind of start with you. Amanda hit on the journey. Jordan talked about the journey. So I want to dive into that a bit. Um, regardless of where this goes after COVID, Olympics, whatever it might be, up until now, your water polo journey, Team USA, everything else you've done, what, what's been the most rewarding thing about being, being a part of all of this and being on this water polo journey for you? Yeah, I, I think it's my teammates. Um, I, I recently spoke to a couple um, high school kids that are looking at colleges and they're asking like, uh, what is this makes this program special or, or that one? And I think just the environment that I've been able to join and the community that I've joined is just so special. And I think the value you get out of team sports is something that will help you throughout your life. And um, I think all of our teammates have touched on kind of the bonds we've made with each other. Um, the, com the, the bonds that come with like thousands of yards of swimming or hours of practice. And it's, it's really hard to mimic that relationship anywhere else in life. And I think um, kind of the things you learn about how you treat people and how you work in, together and work in groups is something that's like helped me in my education and my like job life or what will come. And um, I just think that's so, so special. And I think um, that's something that Waterpool has given me and I'm very thankful for it. Chancellor, same, same question to you. What's, what's been uh, the best part about this water polo journey for you? <laughs> two, two strikes. <laughs> I would say starting from a young age of traveling from West Coast to East Coast for water polo, and then on a more global scale throughout Europe with the the youth junior and senior national team, I, I began to understand how much I love to travel, but how much I love the water polo community. And really, it doesn't matter if you're playing in Orange County, in Chicago, in Spain, Italy, or Greece, everybody has the same passion for the sport and same love for the sport. And really, it's a, it's a, giant community and because of this sport I've developed lifelong friendships with people who are not U.S. citizens and they, they live in Europe and still to this day I, I, I talk to them weekly and it's really great to know that I have friends outside of my immediate family and U.S. teammates and collegiate and club teammates here in the United States. Um, but also I think that it doesn't matter what level everyone plays water polo at. They could play for a couple of years. They could play from a young age up to the senior national team like the four of us. But I think the sport, it makes you become comfortable in uncomfortable situations. And that in itself will prepare anybody for life after water polo and just beyond our sport. Jordan, you told us at the top that as a kid, you wanted no part of water polo. You were gonna be a karate soccer expert, I think it was, and you end up in, in this sport in a major way. What has been the most rewarding part of this water polo journey for you? The boys took all the great answers. I mean, obviously <laughs> the bonds that you make with the teams that you're on from club, high school, college national team getting to see some of your best friends every day it's not a bad thing um, also being able to travel and having friends around the world being able to say oh hey can I come and stay with you and travel here yes that's a great thing to have around the world 
one thing I would add is just the constant pursuit of excellence and constantly striving to be your best, but knowing that you'll never be perfect. So it's, you just keep getting better and better. You can't, there's no way to say I'm perfect. I'm done. There's always a new thing to get better at work on your weaknesses. I think that's one of the best parts. And also the mental game being comfortable, like Chandler said, being comfortable with being uncomfortable mentally athletics it makes your you really mentally tough, especially water polo. No offense to other sports if they're watching, but water polo is one of the hardest sports that I think is out there. And mentally, it really engages you, makes you make it really tests you. Uh, Amanda, in the event that all the good answers have been taken, you can you can expound on this as well. Your your thoughts on the journey, but I'll also add in. We had a great talk yesterday with three water polo families from around the country, California, Illinois, and Florida. And so what has this sport meant to your family as well? I imagine that when you started, even though you said you started late, your parents maybe didn't know all that it was going to entail, but all the things you've been able to do now, do you have a sense of what your water polo journey has meant to them? Um, I do. And I do want to add to the other question first, Please because do. I did yes. have another thing that I'm sure we all feel when you think about those relationships on the teams that we all have, those friendships, what's super fascinating to me is the one thing that you're brought onto the team for is your passion and your work ethic and your skill in water polo, right? So water polo. But every single one of us is so different from one another. Some people are similar and then some people, everybody else just, a lot of people are so different in so many ways. We're not even, I mean, and it's just crazy to fathom that you can be so different from somebody and still be close friends with somebody. And that's just a huge thing that everybody in the world can learn from. Compromise and being open and being yourself, but being okay with people being themselves is huge. And that's why our friendships on a team like this, when you can bond over your passion for polo is, is so special. And then as far as getting to watch ourselves go through this process, me, water polo wise, I've always met all these people and these coaches and these come to all these levels. And I've always just wanted to raise the bar, raise the bar. And you learn that from all the people you meet. And it's such, just to see what standards you can hold yourself to and meet people that shoot, maybe they're doing something different than you were. And to raise that bar and have even higher expectations of yourself is something so unique. And that's water polo, that's sports, that's other things, but sports is huge for that. Um, to see how you can be better as a player and better as a person. And then to answer your other question about my parents, I distinctly remember I was, we just watched the women win gold in 2012 and I walked into the kitchen and I don't know why I was crying, but I was crying. And I told my dad, I cried a lot. I told my dad, like, that is what I want to do. That's where I want to go. And I'm crying now thinking about it because my dad started to cry and he doesn't really cry very often. And he, ever since he had no idea, like I was someone that I was super athletic, like I just wanted to play all the time growing up, but I took middle school PE very seriously. And that was it. I didn't really, I wasn't on any other teams or anything like that. I just was playing with my dad outside and my sisters and then PE, that's all I had to bank on. And so then for that moment to happen with my dad, once I'd started playing and to go back and tell my coach, we didn't know college water polo was a thing when I was a freshman in high school. We didn't know club was a thing. And to see how many different places I've gone since, they totally didn't expect it. And my mom loves to be, you know, one of the moms on the team that's just all about, you know, she likes to be the cheerleader in the stands and to see them find their own niche with what I'm doing. My dad likes to pace up and down off to the side away from, from everybody during a really intense game. Um, and to see both of them just cherish something that means so much to me. Um, and that's just all of our parents are like that. And that's just all about being good parents who want better for your children than you want for yourself. And so that has also taught me for the future when I have kids to invest in the same fashion and um, they had no idea what this was going to come to. Neither did my sisters and to have their support along the way and has been everything. 
Um, but it's cool how they've become a part of the water polo community. It's not just me. That's a great answer. And uh, I, I think you described the journey for a lot of families that maybe didn't have a water polo history and then they see where it goes, or maybe even they did, but they didn't get to the heights that their kids have gotten to. Uh, I also loved your, the first part of your answer, and, and others have alluded to it. Water polo, especially at this level, water polo will, will get you on this team, but it won't be the only thing that will keep you on this team, right? So everyone that's in this group right now, they would not be a part of the group if they were a personality problem or something else, because there's so many talented people out there. But it is an important lesson for others on the team people will make rosters. If all things are equal, who's less of a problem, right? Is a person that might make, make a team. Not related to this group, but in general, right? As you're, as you're trying, if you're a club athlete, high school athlete trying to make a team, being uh, someone who's a good teammate is a useful skill, even if it doesn't show up in the box score. Uh, last thing here, as we kind of wrap up, you guys have been generous enough to share an hour of your time. I really uh, appreciate it. Not that you have anywhere to be, but thank you for doing this. Um, one last question, and I know this has probably already come up because the Olympics were on the way and now they're here again. It happens every four years. You're on Team USA and people will just automatically say to you like, hey, Tokyo, like good luck. Like, like you already made the team without knowing if the roster has been announced, right? And often all the athletes on the team will say, well, wait, we have to, you know, we're still working on it. It's still a work in progress. We don't know yet. But do you let yourself, and you've talked about the, 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 the mental work you've put in, do you visualize what it would be like to be an Olympian? Do you let your mind drift off to an opening ceremony or to a first game? Amanda, you're nodding. I think, yes, I'll, I'll kind of come back and start with you. But do, do you let yourself do that? And is that okay? Or is that, no, I have to leave that over here until I get there? It might be different for all of you. Amanda, how do you deal with it? I mean, we talked about balance before and how desire is a great thing but you have to control it and think about it in small bits at a time. But I think it's really great to envision maybe that gold medal match and you playing in it and your team standing at the podium at the end. Um, and I think that's just a little fuel to the fire each day, especially when you're in kind of a slump. I like to picture that. Um, I have since I was 14 and started playing and I, I continue to because, um, like Dylan was saying, desires, desires everything. It's, it's so true because it, I know for a lot of athletes, it becomes like the elephant in the room, right? The reason you started playing this is because you might've watched the Olympics as a kid and you said, I want to do that. I want to be an Olympian. And then as you get on the doorstep of it, it's sometimes like, well, I'm not quite there yet, but it makes sense. It's, it's even the same thing in college, right? Of course, you're thinking about the national championship, right? So often you're playing a September game and you'll get asked, is anyone thinking about NCAAs? And you're supposed to say, well, no, we're thinking about this weekend in Claremont. And it's like, well, not really. We're really the end goal here is a title. Chancellor, I'll come back to you. Do you let yourself think about being an Olympian? How do you handle that uh, thought process? Absolutely. I, I visualize it multiple times a week, if not multiple times a day, especially now because we're not in the water as much. And so I, I think about my time back at training and then that time back at training, where it can get me. And that's to my ultimate goal, becoming an Olympian. And visualization is huge. We do it before training, before our biggest competitions. And I think it's very important to visualize yourself there at your ultimate goal. And I think if you can't picture yourself there, then you really have to look yourself in the mirror and really tell you or figure out why you're waking up early in the morning to go to these early morning trainings or you're at the pool deck in the blazing sun for six hours a day, swimming thousands of meters. Um, sometimes you're getting in these, these tough battles with your teammates. And so if you can't visualize yourself there, then I think there'd be a problem with, with that in itself so so yes I, I visualized myself there in Tokyo it was 2020 now it's 2021 and I'm still staying positive more than ever and and hopefully uh, I can be there. Jordan I'll go to you and and I like what Chancellor said I mean in a way does all the hard work allow you to visualize it like this is the goal it would be 
silly to not think about it? How do you think about it? I was lucky in that I got the opportunity to actually be present in the 2008 and 2012 um, water polo gold medal matches. So it's very easy for me to visualize it and seeing it on TV in 2016 with the girls that are on the team now and have retired. Of course, I visualize it. If you visualize things, it often materializes. So if it starts in your mind, it tends to go to your body. That's what I believe at least. So visualizing every day is super important for me, not just the end goal, but also playing wise, how I want to be in the water, how I want to feel, what do I do in this situation? But I can't visualize before I go to bed because I will not go to bed. So I have to do it like in the middle of the day, but visualizing is super important aspect of the game. Physically, you're there maybe 10%, 90% of it is mental. So we have to put in the work mentally in order to get to where we want to go. And last but not least, Dylan, uh, when it comes to dreaming about being an Olympian or someone was to say to you, hey, you're on the team, right? You're, you know, you're, you're off to Tokyo here. How do you kind of um, handle your, your thoughts about letting yourself dream about being an Olympian? Yeah, um, I think it's definitely a balance for me. And I've learned, like, I'm sure all of us have had setbacks in our career. So I don't really take anything for granted. Like, I, I know we're hopefuls for a reason. But that being said, um, in the past, I've been a player that's has been getting like has felt a little nervous before the game. And visualization, as all of you guys have talked about, is something that has helped me kind of um, allow me to when I'm in a position I want to be in, be, feel more comfortable because I've thought about it before because I've seen myself do it. So I think um, it would be a mistake to not visualize yourself in those shoes so that when you do get there, you feel better, you play better, your team plays better. Um, so I think for me, it's, it's checking and it's like being, um, I used a word earlier, but uh, I know I'm not there yet, but that doesn't mean I can't visualize it, make myself more comfortable when I get there and allow that to motivate me to do my, my daily process goals or the things I need to do each day to get better. So um, I definitely think about it. I definitely keep it realistic though. Um, and I, I think that's something we all do. Awesome. Well, this was uh, great. This was, you know, felt like a real uh, masterclass here in the psyche of four uh, high-level athletes and how they uh, take on a very, very large goal. I want to thank all of you for being here. Best of luck getting back in the pool and with your uh, Olympic dreams. And as you've all alluded to, you know, no matter what happens in the future, you've all accomplished a ton and have had this great water polo journey. So again, thanks for being here. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having us.